This is possibly the most important part of this course. I kind of hinted at this at an earlier question, but this is possibly the most important part of this course. Pay attention. We did mono.block, okay? The question is, then what's the point? If this is what it takes to get a value out of a mono or out of a flux, okay? Then what's the point of using a mono or a flux? You gotta block somewhere, right? There has to be a block somewhere. So the answer to this is yes, kind of there has to be a block, but it is still helpful because what you wanna do is you wanna go reactive all the way, okay? Reactive all the way. You wanna go reactive all the way because you want to push all the blocks so that at the end, it's just a caller that's blocking, okay? It's just the person who gave the order. I'm gonna take the, the restaurant analogy, okay? So let's say you have a restaurant where the, the person, the cashier, you, 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 let's say it's a fast food restaurant, right? You pay money, get the order, and then the cook cooks it, okay? So let's say the, the cashier is blocking, okay? So you give them the order, the cashier is gonna go, okay, hang on, people waiting in the queue, wait. I got this order, I'm gonna go hand it to the cook and I'm gonna wait there until the cook prepares the food and then I'm gonna get it back. Then the cashier is blocking and the cook is blocking, let's say there is a cook, depends on an assistant cook, that's blocking. So it's blocking all the way, is that good? That's the worst case scenario, right? However, if you were to make the cashier reactive and then only the cook is blocking, but let's say the cook is blocking for an assistant cook, that's still an improvement, right? So minimizing blocking is already an improvement rather than having it block all the way. Now, if you were to make it reactive all the way, ideally what you would like is the only person who is waiting at any point of time needs to be the person who gave the order because they have to wait. They're here for the food, right? They have to just get the food. In fact, they can also be reactive. They can wait, play on their phones. They can talk to someone while the food is being served. But you get the idea, right? Make everything else reactive except for the last piece where the thing is really needed, okay? That itself is an improvement. So you wanna try and make everything reactive and avoid blocking. So that's the point. Yes, at some point of time, there needs to be something blocking to get the actual value, but how much can we push it? How much reactive can we make ev everything else so that it's more efficient, okay? So if you think about web apps, who is the person that gave the order in a web app, right? If you use the, the fast food analogy, it's basically the HTTP request that comes in, right? The HTTP, re HTTP request comes in and from there, it needs to wait, right? From there on, everything else can be reactive, right? There's just one thing which is waiting, which is HTTP request. From there on, everything else is like, it's all, you know, very much event driven. After this happens, it gets called. There's like nothing is blocking and waiting, right? Make, you made your app super efficient. So for every request, there's only one thing waiting. Isn't that an improvement right there? That's an improvement right there. But here's the big plus. So there are reactive web servers, okay? Netty is an example of a reactive web server. Okay? Netty is a separate web server, which is meant for reactive programming model. So what Netty does is it handles even that request in a reactive way, okay? So you have the user waiting on a browser, right? They've made a request, and now this HTTP request comes in, the browser is waiting, but now Netty doesn't spawn a new thread and wait for the response to come, okay? Netty actually keeps track of the request to the mono, and it doesn't hold on to the thread. It keeps it in some data structure somewhere in memory, right? There's no threads pending and waiting. So when you return a mono in the end, eventually, like if you make everything reactive, you return a mono back to Netty, the web server, and say, hey, web server, here is the mono. Whenever this mono completes, give the result to the HTTP request, right? Netty is gonna be like, okay, I got it. I'm gonna keep track of it. And then Netty does a call back on the mono. And when that mono is fulfilled, the return is processed, right? So Netty is kind of optimizing for even that. So you pretty much have no threads waiting on your web server, which is why these web servers can scale, man. It can scale, like you have, if you look at a typical Tomcat instance where you need, you have like, okay, I can do, I don't know, 5,000 incoming requests at a time on top hardware, right? These, you know, reactive servers, like in something like Netty, 
they can go like 100K requests, simultaneous requests. I'm not talking about requests per second, right? 100K simultaneous requests on like a decent cloud hardware. It's amazing because no thread is hanging around. No thread is waiting. It's just doing its work, going on, doing something else and going on and all that. So it makes it super efficient, especially when you have a lot of IO bound operations, like most of your, most of web applications, like you're calling another service, you're calling the Databricks, right? Actual processing is very small. So you can afford to scale up significantly before you hit the limits of like, okay, now we are actually running out of threads. Because at some point of time, there are threads running at the same time. You will run out of threads at a certain point, but the threshold is pushed so much more that it's unbelievable. It's like no comparison there, right? So this is the key. This is why we do reactive. Not because you have to block eventually, but because we are pushing blocking to the end and perhaps removing it from the web server's perspective entirely, okay? So here is here is the example that I gave you earlier, right? The very first thing, like here, here you have a Spring MVC controller, which is returning a mono, right? It's not, you're not blocking here, right? You gave it to the, the controller, gave it to the framework, and the framework takes it from there on, right? So it's basically passing it across. All right. Can you explain how Reactive takes 100K requests simultaneously? <laughs> I'm not saying Reactive will take 100K requests simultaneously. All I'm saying is the threshold at which things break down because of lack of availability of threads is pushed further, okay? It would have, broken much, it would have broken much sooner if things weren't Reactive because everything was blocking and things were waiting. Now, since things aren't waiting, at any point of time, the number of threads blocked and waiting and consumed is significantly lesser. So the threshold is pushed. What would have handled about 5,000 requests at a time tops will potentially be able to handle 100,000 requests for the same hardware. Again, a generic statement depends on the condition, of course. If you have a lot of processing, right? Each one of these, for each element, you're doing Fibonacci series processing, well, you are blocking, right? You are waiting for that thing to complete. But for most use cases where you have database connections and all that stuff, as you can imagine, the amount of threads waiting at a certain point of time is significantly reduced, which means number of threads it can take on, number of requests it can take on is significantly increased. I hope that makes sense. All right, I'm gonna tackle this one question again, right? Still trying to understand how subscribers will know that it is getting overwhelmed. Just trying to think of an example. Okay, let's say you are doing the thing that I told you you're not likely gonna be doing because it's, I'm just trying to think of a hypothetical example, right? So what you're doing is listening to a flux and trying to compute the Fibonacci series for that flux or trying to do some complicated mathematical calculation, okay? I'm trying to come up with an example where you are doing intense processing, which is gonna take more time than the rate of incoming requests, okay? One thing you can do is not care about this at all, right? Just put a lambda in there and say, unsubscribe, execute this complicated calculation. What's gonna happen then? Well, what's gonna happen is, at some point of time, you're gonna run out of threads, okay? One event comes in, you are started the calculation, while the calculation is going on, 10 other events come in, 10 more threads, still calculation is going on, 10 more events come in, you're gonna run out of threads. So what do you do? How do you solve this problem? Well, one way to solve this problem is to keep track of how many calculations you have, right? Manage some state where you have a service, where it's, which is which, where you're delegating the calculations, like, okay, this thing is, um, okay, okay, this is calculation number five, this is calculation number 10, okay? At some point of time, once, let's say you wanna hit the capacity of around 50 calculations, not more than 50 calculations at a time. So what you're gonna do is, when you get to 40, 45 calculations, you're going to send a request of one instead of request of five, perhaps, okay? Or you don't send a request. You wait for the 45 calculations at a time, to reduce to 40 calculations, okay? Once it hits 40 calculations inside that if block, you're gonna say request, and you're gonna get more data. So basically you're doing flow control to say, I don't wanna run out of memory, I don't wanna run out of threads. Basically it is a way for you to, at some point of time, depending on your logic, tell upstream, okay, I want more data, or slow down, I want less data. I hope, I hope that gives you some, some clarity about this. 